أعوذ بالله السميل العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من همزه ونفخي الذي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Let's get started إن شاء الله with chickens As always, how are you guys doing? And some new things to think about if we haven't discussed them before What were some of your growth lessons from the last session or until or from the last session until today um, or since the beginning of our series and what kinds of obstacles have you identified in terms of your growth your progress and so on when do you find yourself happy versus excited so there's a slight difference when do you feel low and overwhelmed meaning you feel low you, you feel overwhelmed you feel stressed out, you feel anxious, you feel depressed, you feel down, whatever it might be. What, when is that? What kinds of things are you doing? What kind of, what kinds of environments are you in? What, have, what has preceded that event or that incident or that experience and so on? This is actually a blend of multiple cases. So somebody reaches out to you, and in this case, it's a female, and she tells you that she has depression and she's taking medication. And this is prescribed medication, not just any kind of medication, right? She has anxiety, panic attacks, and several related conditions. From her perspective, her father was tough on her, and this is one of the sick situations. Um, but I, like I said, it's a multiple, you know, it's a blend of multiple cases, so this is one. Um, and so she knows a lot about Jahannam and so on and so on, right? And, and her siblings um, were also going through this. And so she has sort of like this, uh, and again, like, the, you know, this, this stuff was a little bit more gender biased, as in like it was a little bit more focused on the, the female as opposed to the males and so on. And this is typically what happens in many cultures and stuff like that, right? Um, and that's not a good thing because, um, the, the, you know, the etiquette should be taught to both sides and stuff. Of course, there are differences in terms of um, some things, in terms of like some certain things that, you know, um, certain like, guys have to be good at or that they need to do and they need to know versus girls. Um, but there are also overlaps and stuff like that, some other things and stuff like that. So it should be understood like that. But overall, the idea of, you know, therapy is like, that it has to be for both sides, not just one side. Um, and then this, that, and like, now in this case, this person has been seeing a therapist. Like, you know, this person we're gonna assume has been seeing a therapist. It's uh, it's one of the cases that I'm I'm using here. Um, and this person is seeing a therapist, and they have tried rokia, or they wanted to try rokia and stuff, and other uh, treatments and stuff like that. Whatever is gonna work out, whatever. Um, nothing has been working so far. Uh, their religious commitment is relevant because like some of the cases people are not too like religious in the sense that and when I say religious I put a star there because uh, it, like religious in Islam Islamic terminology of religious would be like you know the word mutadayin and stuff right and this is a person who is like trying to prescribe their way of life uh, they're trying to align it with Islam and Islam is very encompassing it encompasses political stuff, right? It encompasses economic stuff. It encompasses like family dynamics. It encompasses like social justice and stuff. It encompasses human interactions and stuff. It encompasses business and like, you know, uh, yeah, everything, right? So it's very, very broad. But in the context of this particular thing, let's just assume that religious commitment is like um, praying five times a day and stuff and like fasting and doing all those things and stuff, with that, right? Uh, but not really having Islam as their, you know, like the, like the thing that drives them every single morning. They wake up and they're thinking Islam and like the rest of the day, they're thinking of Islam and so on, right? We're going to assume that they're like the, the majority of people um, are the kind where it's like just basic, you know, stuff um, and not like too, too, like, you know, focus and deep and stuff. Like the, the first thing when they wake up is not about like Allah and so on. Oh, and like it doesn't stay like that the entire day, even if it is, right? So we're going to assume that this is just a typical case. In some cases, they may not be praying. In some cases, they might be praying. So it's a thing where, you know, um, the religious commitment is irrelevant here because that it doesn't actually impact. Because in one case, for example, you know, one of the people, one of the people, was not praying. Right? In another case, 
the person was praying. And another case, the person was going on and off and stuff, right? So it, it just depends. So anyways, that's why I'm saying it's irrelevant because uh, given the differences between the three or four or five or whatever, um, uh, I don't remember how many I actually put in here, but yeah, so like that's just that, right? So it, because of the differences, it doesn't really matter um, because the results were the same. So um, the impact here, the scenario is the same pretty much otherwise. Okay, so she has gotten into relationships that she is conflicted about and she feels men have it better than women in Islam. So this is, you know, that kind of mindset where, you know, men have it better than women and stuff and so on and so on. But um, that, that's just how she feels about it. And she did get into a relationship, um, let's say, uh, recently. Um, recently as in relative to when the person reaches out to you, right? And then she is um, conflicted because what happened is that, the, you know, the relationship got broken off or whatever. They were about to get married and stuff and it didn't work out or they might have, like, you know, in one case, it might have actually, like, been sort of, like, boyfriend, girlfriend, and they might have, like, taken it to the next level and stuff, and they didn't get married. And there's other, another case where um, it was just sort of, like, like, they, they, they didn't, like, intimacy wasn't reached, but they were, like, still, like, you know, tight relationship and so on, right? So there's, like, um, it, like on all these cases, they did get into difficult situations, and um, they they took the hit as you know, at the end of the day and here um this you know this person might feel they need like sort of like you know like uh male approval or maybe they need like um some sort of like you know like companionship where it's like really like you know obsessive right and i use the word of obsessive um because in this context like this is one of the words that you know uh like one of the people might have mentioned or multiple people might actually mentioned in this in, in this blend of scenarios and then also this person is reasonable in conversation as in when you talk to them they're they're reasoning with you they're, you know, they're making sense they're not going crazy and stuff right as in uh, crazy meaning like they're not like telling you for example like you know the sky doesn't exist or like you know that that, that things like they're, they're just not like they're there they're present they're talking to you they're f talking to you fine and they're able to carry on a conversation. Yeah, they're, they're very stressed out. They might have some irrational thinking and stuff. But when you actually, like, you know, speak to them and stuff, they're very understanding. They, like, they know what's going on and stuff. They're able to kind of, like, you know, work with you a little bit. They also, they're able to tell you, for example, that they don't understand some of their behaviors. They don't want certain things that, that's going on in their head and stuff and so on. So they're able to work with you like that, right? So that's what I mean by they're, they're being reasonable in conversation. And these people are also intellectual, or this person, let's say, is intellectual meaning that they understand the deen aspect. And again, remember, I'm using the narrow definition of deen, not the actual broader definition, right? Um, and then dunya, because the broader definition encompasses both like what we consider deen and like well, what people consider deen and like also dunya. So the broader definition, the actual definition covers everything. But in this case, it's a combination of these two. And then um, this person uh, has a basic understanding of habits and brain processes how these things work and how things like you know kind of develop and all that stuff they have a basic understanding so they are intellectual as in you can talk to them at like like uh, like you're, you're talking to them um, and not feeling that they're not understanding what you're talking about and they're actually like talking about certain things that they've understood about themselves and so on and so on and then this person is also uh, trying to get over the last relationship that they've had where something bad happened right where they just had to cut off or they got cut off or whatever, depending on like which, which whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, the end result was that this person or these people find themselves sleeping at night or trying to sleep at night, but unable to sleep at night. And they just at night, the entire night, they cry and they, they stay up and they cry and cry and cry and cry until the morning comes in and they still not able to sleep. And uh, what happened is that all of this stuff, all this hurt and pain and all that, has overwhelmed them um, and they've it has debilitated them and they have extremely negative and like you know like like aggressive violent like sort of like uh, feelings and emotions towards the person who they feel has done this to them meaning if a person decided to move on and get married to somebody else or like yeah some like get in a relationship with somebody else or just walk away completely for this from this relationship then at the end of the day uh, this person is feeling like why did they do this to me why did that person do this to me how could they move on how could they like leave me behind and after i put all this effort in and so on 
how am I like why am I having to deal with this and that other person is sort of like happy and fine and moving on and stuff like that right so this is sort of like and then because of that they start they start thinking negative thoughts about the other person like they might make the ha against the other person they might like try to like you know wish evil on the other person and so on right um so just this is the dynamic right now so how do we help her how do we have a person like this this person they like, sometimes like they start they burst out crying just randomly throughout the day but especially at night they just cannot sleep they just leave the house just want to be outside alone and they just want to cry and cry and cry and their families are really worried about them and yeah how do you help that person Some things to just have in your mind. How old is this person? Uh, it, so there, there's there's a range of people here. There's a range of ages. So you don't need to, um, like, it, it is, the age is irrelevant in a sense. Like, I, I, one of the people was young. Uh, I would say probably, like, they're in their early 20s. But then another person was, like, older than that. Another person was even older than that. There's, like, it's a broad range. So, and the, but the age is uh, not as important here. Because the, the intellect, like, the intellectual ability um, and the reasonability in terms of conversation is important. And in, in, in multiple cases, there is an ex there's an extent to which the age can have an impact. But if the mental age is, you know, where like it needs to be, then that it doesn't really have as much of an impact. It does have slight a slight impact, but ultimately because the heart feels the same pain, um, and sometimes you might feel like some people some people that are older if they've gone through cycles like this, then they might feel more pain and they have more feelings of like sort of like hopelessness and like helplessness as well. And then on the other hand, the younger one may also have, this might be the first time or whatever, and so there might be a deeper thing and stuff for them, but uh, it, like, it really depends on the situation, it, but it doesn't have that much of, of a difference across the board because they feel the same t intensity of pain. Because they're, like every new instance that they come in or even the first one, it's like, it's as if it was, you know, every new instance is like the first experience. It's like the first experience is like, you know, every other experience for them because they really go in, they think this is the one that's going to work out. So they, they treat it as if the first, this is the first time and so on. Like they, they sort of forget about like the past and so on in a way, in some you know, in general. So the age is not going to make a difference in here much. Not, not, not as much as the other things that we couldn't approach with. So in, in at least one case, for example, let me go back to that. Um, in one case, for example, there was um, like actual, you know, zina done. And in another case, it wasn't zina, but it was like, um, like it, it was almost there. Like everything but that, you can say, right? And then in another case, it wasn't like they hadn't like gotten that close, right? Um, it was still, um, maybe there was touching involved and stuff, but like maybe not beyond that and stuff, right? Um, so it's like depending on the scenarios, um, there might be another case where um, there there was a different kind of like relationship and stuff where they were really close and personal and like they they shared a lot of the details about their lives and so on and stuff right. So this is how they also got really vested into the relationship and so on. So it depends on like the dynamics and stuff, but yeah, they, but like, all that stuff um, ultimately like there is a common root in here. And that's what I'm trying to address over here. So um, a lot of the other things are going to be secondary. So if we can get the root of the issue, um, that'd be good. And I, I noted the fact that they, they're reasonable in conversation, they're intellectual. Um, and I also mentioned about uh, habits and brain processes and stuff. So I want you to focus on those things and stuff because everything else uh, may not be as relevant uh, in the in the context over here. And there, like I mentioned, you know, wanting some male approval or like some sort of attention and so on. Um, that is a human feeling and stuff. So that is something that most people feel, right? That they want to be, they want to feel like they're part of something and stuff. So, uh, yeah. So you can actually use that as well.
Are we going to talk about that now or watch the videos? Yeah, watch some videos and then come back to it. So okay. go ahead. Let's do the big one on the right. Okay. What causes panic attacks? Okay. Okay. So this is going to go over a little bit of what causes panic attacks. And it's a short video, but I want you to kind of just get an understanding of like how like panic attacks work, what's going on in the person's head. And the, the example that I gave you, they're having panic attacks, remember? So I, I think I mentioned that, they're, that this person is having panic attacks. Yeah, they're having panic attacks. So just kind of understand what panic attacks mean. Uh, and then we can go from there, inshallah. So this is just to give you what happens in the brain and how a person sort of, and how a person would therefore respond to something like this, right? The body becomes its own corset, past, present, and future exist as a single force. A swing without gravity soars to a terrifying height. The outlines of people and things dissolve. Countless poets and writers have tried to put words to the experience of a panic attack. A sensation so overwhelming, many people mistake it for a heart attack, a stroke, or other life-threatening crisis. Though panic attacks don't cause long-term physical harm, afterwards, the fear of another attack can limit someone's daily life and cause more panic attacks. Studies suggest that almost a third of us will experience at least one panic attack in our lives. And whether it's your first, your hundredth, or you're witnessing someone else go through one, no one wants to repeat the experience. Even learning about them can be uncomfortable, but it's necessary because the first step to preventing panic attacks is understanding them. At its core, a panic attack is an overreaction to the body's normal physiological response to the perception of danger. This response starts with the amygdala, the brain region involved in processing fear. When the amygdala perceives danger, it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which triggers the release of adrenaline. Adrenaline prompts an increase in the heart and breathing rate to get blood and oxygen to the muscles of the arms and legs. This also sends oxygen to the brain, making it more alert and responsive. During a panic attack, this response is exaggerated well past what would be useful in a dangerous situation, causing a racing heart, heavy breathing, or hyperventilation. The changes to blood flow cause lightheadedness and numbness in the hands and feet. A panic attack usually peaks within 10 minutes. Then, the prefrontal cortex takes over from the amygdala and stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. This triggers the release of a hormone called acetylcholine, that decreases the heart rate and gradually winds down the panic attack. In a panic attack, the body's perception of danger is enough. Notice the word usage, perception. Enough to trigger the response we would have to a real threat, and then some. We don't know for sure why this happens, but sometimes cues in the environment that remind us of traumatic past experience can trigger a panic attack. Panic attacks can be part of anxiety disorders like PTSD, social anxiety disorder, OCD, and generalized anxiety disorder. Recurring panic attacks, frequent worry about new attacks, and behavioral changes to avoid panic attacks can lead to a diagnosis of a panic disorder. The two main treatments for panic disorder are antidepressant medication and cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Both have about a 40% response rate, though someone who responds to one may not respond to the other. However, antidepressant medications carry some side effects and 50% of people relapse when they stop taking them. CBT, meanwhile, is more lasting with only a 20% relapse rate. So CBT is more programming your brain and this is what we're focusing on a lot more. And um, it, it is uh, shown to be more effective and so that's why we're going into that because we you know cbt requires an understanding of how the brain works a little bit and how you know, the, the behaviors and patterns and so on um, manifest and so that's something that um, we're, we're trying to help with over here 
uh, at least kind of give you an understanding, a deeper understanding of what it's built upon, essentially. The goal of CBT treatment for panic disorder is to help people learn and practice concrete tools to exert physical and in turn mental control over the sensations and thoughts associated with a panic attack. CBT begins with an explanation of the physiological causes of a panic attack, followed by breath and muscle exercises designed to help people consciously control breathing patterns. Next comes cognitive restructuring, which involves identifying and changing the thoughts that are common during attacks, such as believing you'll stop breathing, have a heart attack or die, and replacing them with more accurate thoughts. The next stage of treatment is exposure to the bodily sensations and situations that typically trigger a panic attack. The goal is to change the belief through experience that these sensations and situations are dangerous. Even after CBT, taking these steps isn't easy in the grip of an attack. But with practice, these tools can both prevent and de-escalate attacks and ultimately reduce the hold of panic on a person's life. Outside formal therapy, many panickers find relief from the same beliefs CBT aims to instill. That fear can't hurt you, but holding on to it will escalate panic. Even if you've never had a panic attack, understanding them will help you identify one in yourself or someone else. And recognizing them is the first step in preventing them. So I hope that made sense, understanding panic attacks, how they work and how they can become overwhelming and how therefore to address them. Because if you understand where they're coming from and the, the, the first things that need to be sort of controlled, um, then you can help you know, accordingly. So for example, if a person starts breathing really heavily and they feel like they're gonna die, can they, can't, they can't breathe and stuff, right? Then you can help them in that stuff first. And then as you sort of start relaxing, the thoughts that are you know, manifesting in their head, then you can, you can address those as well and have you know maybe they can talk about it they can talk about what they're feeling uh, what's going on in their head and stuff and you can you can acknowledge or you can validate you know whatever the concerns that they have and so on and then you can continue from there by helping them thereafter but as soon as you sort of stabilize a little bit um, then you can do that and then again with cbt it's just a matter of sort of a training the mind a certain way kind of um, training training it with by doing certain things and changing your associations so the line of best fit that you've had in your history though you might have a certain kind of experience or some things that hurt you a little bit and stuff or a lot and so those eventually don't draw your line of best fit those data points eventually map out your line of best fit which then predicts a certain sort of like a future right in a certain context so it might be for example you uh, had a, like a, a cat bit you one time when you were young and so that really caused you a lot of hurt and pain and there was a lot of like trauma associated with that and then as you grow older and you don't actually <clears throat> break free of that cycle, as in you don't actually disconnect um, or, or you don't actually add new data points that are not like that, then your line of best fit is going to assume that every cat is going to bite you and you're going to become terrified. And so what you would do over here is to, uh, you know, part of the process, one of the parts of the process is to help the person eventually at one point find something like a, have some exposure with a cat and a cat, maybe you'll show a picture, for example, of a cat. Or maybe you'll sort of show a, a, like a, a cat in, in a cage, um, or maybe you'll show a cat like in somebody else's hand, you know, like far away in a leash or something like that. And then, you know, you might let a person actually kind of touch it from the back or some, someone's side or whatever. Uh, and somebody's holding its like head or something like that, right? Uh, or they kind of like, you know, just kind of blocking it so it doesn't do anything. And then as you get more comfortable and stuff, and you go from there, so now you're adding more data points that are changing your line of best fit. And that line of best fit can impact how then you respond in the future because now you've dissociated that one or you, you've um, minimized the effect of that one data point that was sort of like the outlier and in fact you might be able to even eliminate that from the thing because you might be able to fill in the gap remember i was talking about filling the gap your, your brain tries to fill in the gap so you might be able to fill in the gap with something like oh you know maybe i i scared it and that's why it was scared and so that's why it attacked me or something like that or some other reason and that's going to help you sort of close that case and move forward in the meantime, which other, which, what was the next pick for you guys?
Left. That's one? Left. Left. Okay. Now, this one is a more com like this is a longer term thing. Um, and so, panic attacks are something that could happen once or twice or so on. But now, imagine like if you have a certain mindset um, and it continues to, like your, your environment sort of stuff, uh, cements it in you essentially because you start sort of feeling this or internalizing it and stuff until you start getting into this state of existence as opposed to panic attacks, which are not so, um, like they might not be happening every single day, but this is like a condition, like this is the state that you're in, the, the depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. In the United States, close to 10% of adults struggle with depression. But because it's a mental illness, it can be a lot harder to understand than say, high cholesterol. One major source of confusion is the difference between having depression and just feeling depressed. Almost everyone feels down from time to time. Getting a bad grade, losing a job, having an argument, even a rainy day can bring on feelings of sadness. Sometimes there's no trigger at all. It just pops up out of the blue. Then circumstances change, and those sad feelings disappear. Clinical depression is different. It's a medical disorder, and it won't go away just because you want it to. It lingers for at least two consecutive weeks and significantly interferes with one's ability to work, play, or love. De Notice I mentioned in this case, the, the, this person, or this case that we were talking about, had, was debilitated with this thing, right? So they were, they were having this experience, and as a consequence, they were debilitated in terms of they were not able to perform their daily functions and so on. Like, they weren't able to do that one. Like, they were able to use the restroom and eat and all that, but they were, like, doing it at, like, a very altered uh in very altered manners. And so for example, they might not be eating the right kinds of food or they might be eating very little amounts or maybe a lot of a lot of it and stuff or they might be um, kind of like a, like a bad schedule or something like that or uh, they might not be, for example, they might not want to go to uh, hang out with friends or they might start changing their patterns and so on. So just keep those things in mind that it does have an impact that can actually impact them like moving forward. Um, in, in a way that's actually help, helpful to them on a daily basis. So somebody else has to sort of like look out for them and take care of them and so on oftentimes. Depression can have a lot of different symptoms. A low mood, loss of interest in things you'd normally enjoy, changes in appetite, feeling worthless or excessively guilty, sleeping. This is important, feeling of, feeling of worthlessness and personalizing things. Remember we talked about uh, personalization as one of, the, um, uh, one of the aspects of a narcissist as opposed to an optimist, right? A pessimist, sorry, uh, as opposed to an optimist. Um, and, and so in this case, the, the pessimist might assume that everything that's going wrong is because of them. And you can see how that can like grow and get there, you know, do the snowball effect eventually until a person really feels deep down inside that things are not going well in their life because they themselves are not good. But that person himself is not a good person or it's a failure, that person is a failure in life, right? And this is the consequences of the fixed mindset approach that a lot of people were taking until relatively recently. And this is where, you know, when you praise somebody, for example, um, for the uh, for the grade or the result that they got and not the process. So if you praise your kids for the getting an A, for example, or if you've you know, said, you know, great job, you did this amazing thing and stuff, right? You've praised them for the end result and you sort of trained them to become fixed mindset individuals. And so now if they don't get that good, you know, grade or whatever, then they're going to personalize it and internalize it as they are uh, not smart enough. They're not intelligent enough or maybe there's something wrong with them and that's why they weren't able to fix this situation or that situation. If they didn't pass a class, they didn't get a job or whatever, that failure is going to translate into them personalizing that. And so that's very important over here, you know, to keep in mind that it is, you know, societal impact in this context, whether it could be, you know, it could be like society as, as, as a whole, um, or it could also be um, family, for example, or it could be uh, spouses, it could be parents, it could be whoever, that the kinds of things that people say to other people, it has an impact on them. And so we have to be very, very careful in how we interact with people. Because if we're not like that, if we're sort of like, um, if we are blaming people or chastising people like left and right, without actually, you know, giving them a heads up of consequences and so on. Or if we say you're such a bad person, how could you do something like this or whatever? Those are things we're actually training them to impersonalize failures and, and like bad things and stuff. So I know one person, for example, that um, one of the situations was that um, this person had a parent that was excessively like um, personalizing things about them. As in, they were saying that you are a person who is selfish, or, you know, whatever, whatever and stuff until and they started you know they would say these kinds of things because of certain you know 
the seven things that they wanted the person to do differently, right? So they would say, you know, you're like this like, because you're not doing this and this, right? As in, you are this person, this negative person, or you have this negative quality in you, or like, sorry, this negative aspect of who you are, um, and as in, you're a person, right? And uh, this this is because of the fact that you're not, not doing this or this, or at least from my perspective, right? And so eventually, the person, especially if the person values you know this this first person's opinion a lot then the second person the, the person who's hearing this stuff actually starts believing it about themselves and they start believing that this is how i am and stuff and then they start becoming more and more depressed until things can get really messy right and then it's not it's not good to do that so being being very mindful of how you, we interact with people is a very important thing and a lot of times parents teachers like uh, community members, leaders, and so on, can have this impact on their on the people that they're supposed to look out for and protect and care for, and that's that's very um, you know I, I, this is one of those things that like I'm really passionate about in terms of like teaching people, um, and I hope that it does uh, have an impact in Chalda with these with these sessions. Um, and it, again, these people, uh, the people that are doing these kinds of things, may not have ill intent; they just didn't know any better, right? Um, or maybe they did, but didn't like they thought it was they misapplied some information or so on so it can always be learned and these overseers can actually like you know change the dynamics and stuff start learning and grow essentially so just keep in mind that that was the 30 minute mark that was the 15 minutes after the introduction okay. either too much or too little let's go back poor right. concentration Restlessness or slowness, guilty. Sleep diet, feeling worthless or excessively guilty. Sleeping either too much or too little. Poor concentration, restlessness or slowness, loss of energy, or recurrent thoughts of suicide. If you have at least five of those symptoms, according to psychiatric guidelines, you qualify for a diagnosis of depression. And it's not just behavioral symptoms. Depression has physical manifestations inside the brain. First of all, there are changes that could be seen with the naked eye and x-ray vision. These include smaller frontal lobes and hippocampal volumes. On a more micro scale, depression is associated with a few things. The abnormal transmission or depletion of certain neurotransmitters, especially serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Blunted circadian rhythms or specific changes in the REM and slow wave parts of your sleep cycle and hormone abnormalities such as high cortisol and deregulation of thyroid hormones. But neuroscientists still don't have a complete picture of what causes depression. It seems to have to do with a complex interaction between genes and environment, but we don't have a diagnostic tool that can accurately predict where or when it will show up. And because depression symptoms are intangible, it's hard to know who might look fine but is actually struggling. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, it takes the average person suffering with a mental illness over 10 years to ask for help. But there are very effective treatments. Medications and therapy complement each other to boost brain chemicals. In extreme cases, electroconvulsive therapy, which is like a controlled seizure in the patient's brain, is also very helpful. Other promising treatments, like transcranial magnetic stimulation, are being investigated too. So if you know someone struggling with depression, Encourage them, gently, to seek out some of these options. You might even offer to help with specific tasks, like looking up therapists in the area or making a list of questions to ask a doctor. To someone with depression, these first steps can seem insurmountable. If they feel guilty or ashamed, point out that depression is a medical condition, just like asthma or diabetes. It's not a weakness or a personality trait. Notice what they said, it's not a weakness or a personality trait. So in here... There is a situation that happens in your brain, and as a result of this, certain things manifest, um, and it is something that can be addressed. And so it's just like any other condition that a person might go through. Um, whether you know, sometimes you might have something in your arm, sometimes you might have something in your leg, sometimes you might have something in your in your lungs, for example. Uh, and these are all conditions that can happen. Um, all of them are going to be uh, are are are, work, um, are influenced by certain chemicals and so on. These are also controlled by your brain, and so if your brain also gets something, then again, this is just part one part of your body, right? Just because it's your brain doesn't mean that it's a different like it's like a 
like it's something different fundamentally than your heart or uh, your your lungs in the sense that they're all organs and so well, if we understand it like that then yes it's like just like anything else and they shouldn't expect themselves to just get over it any more than they could will themselves to get over a broken arm if you haven't experienced depression yourself avoid comparing it to times you've felt down comparing what they're experiencing to normal temporary feelings of sadness can make them feel guilty for struggling yeah and, and that's one thing and then another thing they can actually feel more upset um or it could be because you're feeling guilty for it but also because they feel like you're undermining my actual experience and you don't actually understand what's going on so sometimes i found it useful to like you know just just like not say anything and just be like like i i can't imagine what you're going through you know um, and it looks like it's very tough and i you know i just want to be here with you and stuff whatever it takes sort of like that right as opposed to saying, yeah, I get it. I understand what you're going through and stuff. And it's like, no, you're not. You don't understand what I'm going through, sort of, right? And even if you've been through depression, you may not feel the same way as they felt or that they're feeling. Or even if you do feel the same way, if we were able to measure that somehow, it wouldn't really help in terms of, like, in the situation um, because the person is just trying to, like, tell you that this is the situation that they're in. And, uh, you know, they just need a, a customized solution for them and not necessarily what worked for you, right? something that's contextual to them even just talking about depression openly can help for example research shows that asking someone about suicidal thoughts actually reduces their suicide risk open conversations about mental illness help erode stigma and make it easier for people to ask for help and the more patients seek treatment the more scientists will learn about depression and the better the treatments will get So the last one is, and the last one is going to be talking about hormones and how the brain functions and so on. So now that you have a little bit of understanding of, um, you know, panic attacks and a little bit more understanding of the long-term depression scenarios um, and, and sort of like what, what could happen in the brain and like, you know, how, what, what kind of symptoms you need to be aware of. Now we can go into how the brain actually works. Because remember they were talking about that in the first video about CBT, but in the second video also about certain things that happen in your like some things that happen in terms of your, your, your functionality and your chemicals and so on. So we're going to talk about a little bit. He's going to talk about that. Um, this video is very fast paced because it is the, one of the crash course videos. But I just want you to get the gist of it um, because we're not trying to, you know, we're, nobody's going to become like a, you know, necessarily an expert through these the webinars. Um, but I just want an introduction to this. So you have some idea of, okay, there is this underlying you know, process that's going on um, or underlying processes that are going on that are impacting this. And so I need to understand that it's not as simple as me just telling the person, okay, well, you know, just do this like that and stuff. But you have to actually go deeper and try to understand what's happening at a deeper level. So you understand that this is a multidimensional, multifaceted um, situation and you have to apply a multifaceted approach or at least something that accounts for that multidimensional nature. Say it's late at night, you're home alone, drifting off to sleep, just entering that dream about Fritos, and then suddenly there's a banging at the door. Suddenly, you're wide awake, and it feels like your heart's gonna explode. You jump up, ready to run out the back door, possibly grab a Phillips head screwdriver and stab it into the darkness until it sticks into something. Now, whether it's a weeping angel or your neighbor looking to borrow a can of beans, it doesn't really matter, because when you heard that sudden noise, your startled brain released an icy typhoon of chemicals and everything that's now going through your mind like your urge to flee your urge to defend yourself that internal debate about whether weeping angels are even real and well where's the cat all that is just the result of those chemicals our brains and our nervous systems and the substances they produce and are always bathed in are amazingly complex nuanced systems and even though we're always talking about our mental activity as being somehow separate from all of the biological stuff going on in our bodies in reality the moods ideas impulses that flash through our minds are spurred by our biological condition as psychologists like to say everything psychological is biological so one way to understand how your mind works is to look at how the chemistry of your body influences how you think sense and feel about the world around you to do that we begin at the simplest level the system with the smallest parts it's all about the neuron baby <laughs> Now, 
Neurons, or nerve cells, are the building blocks that comprise our nervous systems. Neurons share the same basic makeup as our other cells, but they have electrochemical mojo that lets them transmit messages to each other. Your brain alone is made up of billions of neurons, and to understand why we think or dream or do anything, you gotta first understand how these little transmitters work. You actually have several different types of neurons in your body, from ones that are less than a millimeter long in your brain to ones that run the whole length of your leg. Yes, you have cells as long as your legs, which is nothing compared to the 150 feet the nerve cells of some dinosaurs had to be. I'm getting off topic, sorry. No matter how big a nerve is, they all have the same three basic parts, the soma, dendrites, and axon. The soma, or cell body, is basically the neuron's life support. It contains all that necessary cell action like the nucleus, DNA, mitochondria, ribosomes, and such. So, if the soma dies, the whole neuron goes with it. The dendrites, as bushy and branch-like as the trees they're named after, receive messages and gossip from other cells. They're the listeners whispering what they hear back to the soma. The axon is the talker. This long, cable-like extension transmits electrical impulses from the cell body out to other neurons or glands or muscles. Whereas the dendrites are short and bushy, the axon fiber is long and, depending on what type of neuron it is, is sometimes encased in a protective layer of fatty tissue called the myelin sheath. It's almost like an insulated electrical wire. The myelin sheath speeds up the transmissions of messages, and if it degrades, as it does with those affected with multiple sclerosis, those signals are degraded as well, eventually leading to lack of muscle control. Neurons transmit signals either when stimulated by sensory input or triggered by neighboring neurons. The dendrites pick up the signal and activate the neuron's action potential or firing impulse that shoots an electrical charge down the axon to its terminals and toward the neighboring neurons. The contact points between neurons are called synapses. All those bushy little dendrites are decorated with synapses that almost, but don't quite touch the neighboring axon in the tiniest game of I'm not touching you of all time. They're less than a millionth of an inch apart. And that microscopic cleft is called the synaptic gap. So, when an action potential runs down to the end of an axon, it activates the chemical messengers that jump that tiny synaptic gap, flying like that little air kiss and landing on the receptor sites of the receiving neuron. Those messengers are neurotransmitters. Although neurotransmitters slide right into their intended receptors like a key into a lock, they don't stay bonded to the receiving neuron. They just sort of pop out, having excited or inhibited the receiving neuron's trigger, then the extras immediately get reabsorbed by the neuron that released them in the first place in a process called reuptake. Kind of like, here you go, psy! So neurons communicate with neurotransmitters, which in turn cause motion and emotion. They help us move around, make jazz hands, learn, feel, remember, stay alert, get sleepy, and pretty much do everything we do. Some of them just make you feel good, like the endorphins we get flooded with after running 10 miles or falling in love or eating a really good piece of pie. We've got over 100 different kinds of these brilliant neurotransmitters. Some are excitatory and others are inhibitory, and all are good reminders that everything psychological is also biological excited i had a teacher uh, for a, a certain like a series of uh, physics courses that i was taking and he used to always talk about how biology and chemistry is actually just just physics and so from his perspective everything psychological that is also bio biological is then also more importantly under the umbrella of physics Predatory neurotransmitters rev up the neuron, increasing the chances it will fire off an action potential. Norepinephrine is one you're probably familiar with. It helps control alertness and arousal. Remember this one right here? Serotonin and dopamine. These are three that are very important in terms of the, how the brain processes things and how um, we need to, uh, what we need to understand about them when we work with you or other people um, in various contexts. Glutamate is an... Epinephrine is one you're probably familiar with. It helps control alertness and arousal. Glutamate is another involved in memory, but an oversupply of it can wig out the brain and cause seizures and migraines, which is why some people are sensitive to all that MSG or monosodium glutamate in their ramen. Inhibitory neurotransmitters, on the other hand, chill neurons out, decreasing the likelihood that the neuron will jump into action. GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter, and you've probably heard of serotonin, which affects your mood and hunger in sleep. Low amounts of serotonin are linked to depression, and certain class of antidepressants help raise serotonin levels in the brain. So, I'm not... so serotonin is also the thing that helps your mood feel good. This is the one we talked about, uh, you know, excitement versus feeling good. So this is the one you actually feel good and you feel happy and you feel 
uh, this is a long-term feeling and stuff, right? So you just kind of overall feel content with things and stuff, right? And that's serotonin. Transmitters like acetylcholine and dopamine play both sides and can both excite or inhibit neurons. To and so when it comes to dopamine, this is also where addiction and stuff, uh, and this is what one of the things that addiction is connected to. So this is the thing that you get really excited about. You lose like impulsive behaviors and so on. Depending on what type of receptors they encounter, acetylcholine enables muscle action and influences learning and memory. Alzheimer's patients experience a deterioration of their acetylcholine producing neurons. Dopamine, meanwhile, is associated with learning, movement, and pleasurable emotions. And excessive amounts of it are linked to schizophrenia as well as addictive and impulsive behaviors. So neurotransmitters are basically your nervous system's couriers, but they aren't the only chemical messengers delivering the news. They've got some competition brewing in the endocrine system so just keep in mind that there are healthy levels of these but there's also unhealthy levels that can impact the person um, and these could be because of certain thought processes certain environmental cues triggers uh, certain fear responses that a person might have also your diet can have a big impact in terms of these levels but also your habits and exercise and things like that can also play a role in terms of the dynamics that happen in your brain as a consequence you've been through puberty you know what I'm talking about. Hormones. Like neurotransmitters, hormones act on the brain, and indeed, some of them are chemically identical to certain neurotransmitters. Hormones affect our moods, arousal, and circadian rhythm. They regulate our metabolism, monitor our immune system, signal growth, and help with sexual reproduction. You could say that most of them boil down to the basics, attraction, appetite, and aggression. Whereas neurons and synapses flick on and off, sending messages with amazing speed, the endocrine system likes to take its time, delivering the body's slow chemical communications through a set of glands that secrete hormones into the bloodstream where they're ferried to other tissues especially the brain so while the nervous and endocrine systems are similar in that they both produce chemicals destined to hit up certain receptors they operate at very different speeds it's like if the nervous system wants to get in touch with you it sends you a text but if the endocrine system has a message Make the stamp and put it on write your address and then the note and the pen on paper and then fold it up and put and mail it to you with the post office. But fast isn't always better and your body will remember that letter longer than the text. Hormones, they linger, which helps explain why it takes some time to simmer down after a moment of severe fright or anger. And our endocrine systems have a few important hormone brewing glands. We've got a pair of adrenal glands snuggled up against our kidneys that secrete adrenaline and that famous fight or flight hormone that jacks up your heart rate blood pressure and blood sugar giving you that tidal wave of energy preparing you to run like heck or punch that charging baboon in the throat the pancreas sits right next to the adrenal gland and oozes insulin and glucagon hormones that monitor how you absorb sugar your body's main source of fuel your thyroid and parathyroid glands at the base of your throat secrete hormones that regulate your metabolism and monitor your body's calcium levels if you have testicles they're secreting your sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone and if you got ovaries they're doing that job and all those glands are super important but there is one gland that rules them all and in the darkness binds them the pituitary gland although it's just a little pea-sized nugget hidden deep in the bunker of the brain it is the most influential gland in this system it releases a vital growth hormone that spurs physical development and that love hormone oxytocin that promotes warm fuzzy feelings of trust and social bonding what really makes the pituitary the master gland is that its secretions boss around the other endocrine glands but even the pituitary has a master in the hypothalamus region of the brain which we will talk more about next episode so <laughs> If I manage to scare you, sorry, but I'm illustrating a point. You have no control over being scared, but maybe now you do understand a little more clearly how your nervous and endocrine systems worked together to call the shots. First, the sensory input from your eyes and ears went to your brain. The simplest bits of your hypothalamus without even letting you analyze it and more like, Wah! and then that ran down the chain of command from your pituitary to your adrenal glands to the hormone adrenaline to the rest of your body and then back to your brain, which then realized that I was just messing with you and told everybody to just calm down for once. The whole deal is a feedback loop. Your nervous system directs your endocrine system, which directs your nervous system, brain, gland, hormone, brain. And of course, each of these systems is fantastically complex, way more than we can get into here. So in our next lesson, we're going to get all up in your brain and delve deeper into the different components of your nervous system, find out what your old brain is, and learn about how much of your brain you actually use. In the meantime, thank you for watching this lesson in crash.
Crash Course Psychology, which was brought to you by Zane Ice, who wants to say hi to his friend Harrison. Thank you, Zane. If you'd like to sponsor an episode and give your own shout-out, you can learn about that and other perks available to our Subbable subscribers. Just go to subbable.com slash Crash Course. This episode was written by Kathleen Yale, edited by Blink Bastino, and our consultant is Dr. Ranjit Bhagwat. Our director and editor is Nicholas Jenkins. The script supervisor was Michael LaRonda, who is also our sound designer, and the graphics team is Thought Cafe. All right, so we finished all these videos, and I hope it gives you an understanding of some of the things that we were talking about in the scenario, and as well, and it also gives you some some basic understanding of how the brain processes work and how something being offset due to various things from the external environment, from your own perceptions of things, and so on, can have an impact. For example, if you perceive a uh, you know if you if you perceive some um, some danger in, in a situation how you're going to react to it because your brain is going to then translate that into some sort of response just like when he did that you know the, the thing the illustration and he then he mentioned like that scary feeling that you had um, so it, that's that's what you can also perceive in your own mind because you're assuming or you're thinking that this is how things work out and so your line of best fit then can have this response on you in different situations this can also give you a little bit of understanding of how panic attacks work and how you can actually uh, mitigate them and how to like resolve certain things that might be holding you, um, for lack of a better word, hostage to those things that are holding you as such. So we can we can break those cycles, inshallah. So I hope this is helping. And with this, let's see if you have anything. Um, if you have anything that you want to go over, anything that you want to break down, uh, any thoughts you have, and then we'll go back to the uh, the riddle. So I also see it's 30 minutes now, or it was a few minutes ago. Okay. So anything you guys want to mention over here, or would you like to go back to the scenario? I don't have anything for this. How would you respond to this? By the way, some of these cases are not from North Carolina, some of them might be. Um, but they're also not from North, uh, from the area generally. Um, I, I like sometimes our team gets uh, connections from like throughout North Carolina, but also in different states and so on. Um, so, and and, and there, there's multiple cases like this. That's why I blend them together. And this is not a specific case. In this in this particular situation, um, I did blend multi-state scenarios or, or cases any thoughts I mean, the big problem or one of them is her issue with uh, self-worth I don't know if that's the main one, though. Yeah, it is one of them. Maybe one of the more fundamental ones. And then I guess the other one is just her perception of different things. It seems like mostly the her perception of the Dean. It's been skewed in a way where it's like lopsided. How does that kind of getting into the situation and the, then the situation she's in, the depression she's in right now. Right, see that first part again? So how, how does that connect with her depression and the situation of the breakup? Um, I mean, it, it lowers her self-worth. Okay, 
So from that perspective, um, her perception of being could make her feel that it could. Yeah. 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 Her, if her perspective of Dean was better, like it would, it would, like the, her, I guess her breakup wouldn't have hurt her as much. Well, maybe, maybe it could have stopped her because, you know, if she was really here and she was really, really trying and she was just sort of like blindsided when it happened, uh, the person would have just decided to cut off and just walk away and do something else. Okay. In that case, it could definitely like blindside a person because they started to sort of really thinking that this is going to work out, whether they're going to get married or whatever, but they really thought that this is going to work out. And then something happens and they just like, you know, that's it. So they get blindsided because they feel like I invested so much into this and I, you know, I was starting to sort of like normalize this as like something that's going to happen long term. But herein, what I just said has, has a, a conflict over here based on what we were talking about. So what was the situation over here that led her to, that, that she did wrong, um, that she sort of ended up getting caught by this? Maybe not like, you know, instead of saying wrong, maybe it's not, maybe it's not in the right way. Maybe she didn't do it the right way. Let's say that. So you're asking, like, what got her to where she is now with the guy she broke up with? Yeah, as in, like, now she, like, you know, whether she initiated it or he initiated it. And in this blend of things, it's actually both. In, in one case, it was, you know, one person initiated. In your case, it was a female and then she one. So right, whatever the situation is at the end of the day. But what, what is something that really, like, impacted her? What is one of the reasons why she is currently in this situation? Um, but, uh, let's let's focus on the. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It has to do something with expectations and hope. Yeah, it seemed like she lacked hope. You mentioned she knows a lot about Jahannam, but I'm assuming she doesn't know as much about reward from Allah. And her perspective um, was that her dad was tough. Um, with re with regards to teaching them about the dean so um uh i think she has like a negative perception of allah okay but um, hope relative to her own life so you're talking about hope in allah right after let's talk about hope in her own mind like about her affair like you know her relationship and like whatever is going to happen in this, like if the marriage is going to like actually like uh, materialize or is it not going to, what's going to happen and so on. So tell me about that, like hopes in that sense, in the sense of like the world, the situation, like in her you know, lifelines or like the life, right? like life progression or whatever, life events. If she hasn't had very positive experiences with men, then she has very little hope that she can have a positive experience with men. Okay, so you're right. You're absolutely right. And that is one of the things that, she, that, is, that is impacting her. But um, also think about this. You, the, like This is one thing that needs to be addressed. Um, uh, simultaneously, there's another thing to think about. And that is that this every time she gets into a relationship, she actually starts like feeling that like love and all that stuff. So the negative, the aversion is not actually present. And like there are, you know, conflicts and arguments and stuff like that. But like she actually feels that she's like really, really connected with this person and she wants to stay with this person. And that's where the male approval or like you're wanting to have a companion situation does come in. I think it would help if um, 
like she learned about how Islam elevated women rather than brought them down. She does know that. She, already knows she, that. Do, she knows that. But, you know, like, remember I said her, she, uh, she's intellectual from a deen and dunya perspective. She has understanding of these things already. But she doesn't believe it, though, if she feels this way. Yeah, in the moment, she doesn't believe it. Yeah. Because things are not going her way. I think the women like you're bad for her. And so she feels like why like why do women have to go through this long, like emotional like roller coaster and stuff like that? Then when men don't have to go through something like this, they can just walk away and they're done. So that is one of like the sort of like things that she's not happy with. So it's not like necessarily she doesn't know that Allah had that it has raised, you know, status of what women and stuff and so on. Uh, like when it comes to the mother or like other other things in life and stuff, right? She doesn't it's not like she doesn't know that, she knows that. So it sounds like she <clears throat> just needs proof to see for herself. Not about proof. Proof is it's not, not about. Okay. Yeah. Is not. Here, so let, let me help you a little bit. There's a brain. Let's think of it like this. Um, obviously, it's not like this exactly, but let's 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 help you sort of like help you understand like how to differentiate between like your emotional response and your like uh, mental response, right? Like. Uh, let, let's think of it as more like feelings versus like, uh, like like a brain like function like uh, feelings versus uh, like thought processes essentially that are more intellectual in the sense that uh, I, I'm thinking of a like a word for this but like there's a, you know the aspect of feeling with the heart versus feeling with the uh, with, versus thinking with your head right so think of it like that think of it she knows it in her head all these things. But right now, she's feeling something that's overwhelming. Her feeling is overwhelming her judgment and so on. The issue is not about whether she knows this or not. The issue is about her feeling right now. How do you manage feelings? How do you navigate them? Your brain is telling you, hey, like, okay, well, you know, this is a situation and certain things that you could have done differently. But right now, she's hurt. She's depressed because she's hurt and she's feeling low by herself. She just doesn't want to do anything. She just wants to stay at home. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I think, mm, like, obviously, um, like, with all the other cases, um, she needs to, like, tell you all this stuff. And I think that is going to help her a little bit just to get it off her chest. Yeah, talking about it definitely helped oh, because at least like she talks about it and then like all the pain and like the stuff she's feeling, she can listen to her and say, like you can just be there with it. Yeah, that's definitely a huge, huge thing. Yeah, and you have to like make sure she feels understood. Uh, n not ex not like you know exactly how she feels, but you, she needs to feel like your sympathy, I think. Um, okay. How do you help her with this depression? She's not able to sleep at night. She's been like taking medication. She's been doing drugs even. In one of the cases, the person was doing drugs even because they just wanted this to end. Like just they they considered suicide, but they said it's harm, so they're not gonna do it. So that was something, I think we mentioned in one of the cases before that people have, you know, these boundaries and stuff um, sometimes. Uh, so she had contemplated it, but she knew very well that, you know, this is not right. So then instead she tried to do drugs. And, you know, in one case, um, uh, the person like thought about you, like doing, like drinking and like drinking their problems away, so to speak, right? And you might've seen this in like, you know, like uh, media and like movies and stuff. Right? That, that's one of the things that people do end up doing to sort of like black out of brown out even. This, this, actually something like this, uh, there's another case that's similar, not to this extent, but like it is similar, but it's for a guy, somebody else, another guy was feeling this way and he reached out to us. Is just go out and like try different things, try different strategies. It's a simulation over here, so it's not like you're, you're actually working with a live person here, right? 
So you know, if you if you make these mistakes now, it's it's okay. But, you know, that that way, when you actually come across a person who's going through depression, and it, depression is uh, very prevalent nowadays, uh, and it is something that's overwhelming a lot of people. And there are roots and stuff when it comes to our you know our mindsets and what society or like other people sort of make us feel. Culture sort of between culture and context and so on, and so. Like you know, these things can have an impact. So this is, this is something that is like very prevalent. If you're working with anybody, you you should have a good understanding of this. So to go ahead and brainstorm. Go ahead and like throw out ideas and stuff. We will discuss it. Like if you say something, and if it's like something that might be like a second level or a second step, I'll, I'll let it know. Like I'll say that if it. So brainstorm. Try your best and stuff. When I was going through like a lot of these kind of things and stuff, like you know, training wise and stuff. Um, whether you know whatever it was like whether it's like something related to this or something related to like general like working with people and so on um, my mentors and teachers were always encouraging me to ask like ask questions just kind of take an attempt and stuff just kind of don't worry about being wrong i want to ask has she gone back to her doctor who was prescribing the medication to let them know that the medication is not working and that she is still feeling the depression and she can't sleep um, and the other side effects that she's having. So there's only like, you know, when it comes to uh, depression, they like the medication can help, right? Um, but it doesn't necessarily actually fix the situation. So even if you try different, and this person actually has mentioned that they've tried different, uh, actually multiple people had, uh, you know, in these cases, they actually mentioned that they've tried different uh, medications and none of them are actually like solving the issue. They're just treating it, right? Um, so yeah, this person might take it. And I think in one conversation, I believe for one of them, um, I was um, uh, like in, in the middle of the conversation, this person took, you know, and, and they were getting really like hyped up, hyped up in a negative way. Like they were getting really upset and emotional about everything. Um, everything that, you know, any word that I might say, I had to be like walking on like, you know, thin ice essentially, right? And, uh, like they 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 were sort of like personalizing everything I said, and then coming up with an assumption of what I actually meant about it, and then being upset at me for that assumption that they had assumed about me, right? And then I would like, and then I would say, wait a minute, like, let's pause for a second, and I would say, and like I would kind of like break it down and ask them questions and stuff to make them like to see like why they were assuming this or like you know if it's something that I said or is it something that they're thinking I said and stuff, right? And so um, but like these things were sort of like. Just this, you know, this dynamic was like kind of like for them it was like overwhelming because they, um, one of the things that one of the people was doing is that they were, you know, like sometimes you have this relationship, you can be like, you know, you have conversations and all that stuff, so you also keep messages and pictures and things like that, right? So, um, uh, so one of the things that I, I encourage people in these situations to do is to be able to find closure. They need to like get rid of, and um, in this particular case. Um, or in these cases, the people are, were not necessarily willing to let go of those things because they still had this hope that they're going to get back with this person and stuff and things are just going to work out better and stuff and so on or whatever, right? So um, I would encourage them to like, you know, take their steps and actually get rid of those messages instead of just delete them and move on, right? Um, so eventually when they were like one of the people, for example, when they did delete these messages and I was having a conversation and kind of like going through the next steps and so on, and they started getting like really like you know um, stressed out, and they started feeling like you know like they they felt like they lost something that they could go back to and stuff the messages and stuff right, and but the problem was that every time they were in the mess they were listening like they were reading reading the messages, they would um, remember we would they would like freshen their memory of those experiences and stuff, and they were doing it like at least once a day, so they would look through the messages and then they would remember the good times and what they and what they're not getting now and stuff and so on, and so that would be like like. Um, refresh in their mind what, what they were trying to actually you know, like not have in their mind and so at night they would wake up in the middle of the night and they would start crying because they would remember those things because it's fresh in their mind again every single day they were making it fresh in their mind so we had to get rid of that because that was the thing that was actually making it difficult for them to actually get away from this right disconnect from them so when we did this um, this person started feeling like you know uh, they said um, you're making me, you made me uh, delete the messages but on top of that now like you know, you are thinking like I'm a bad person or whatever and so on. And then like, you know, I, and then, so I would have to stop and then I would have to kind of like ask certain questions or like I would try to say, you know, certain things or whatever that would help them sort of feel better. But then they took Medicaid, like they took their pill, right? One of the pills. And then suddenly they, they calmed down. 
and then they started talking to me like completely normal like yeah you know i just took my medication and stuff and now uh, i feel much calmer and stuff and, and then yeah and then right after that they started speaking with me without like actually reason reasoning reasoning with me and so on and understanding what's going on and stuff and there you know um and so on so now it wasn't like you know irrational thoughts and stuff they weren't overwhelmed by things because it's kind of helped them out but nonetheless they still felt the hurt because every once in a while they would just burst out crying and again i just gave you one example of one of the people but it's the same sort of scenario in, in most of these cases so changing habits and changing routines um maybe adding something new to you know whether it's a hobby or a sport or something that can divert their attention for a while okay so that's that's step two though you, you know why because the person right now is not actually wanting to like actually go out and do those things they, they they want to but they're not able to get themselves to do it does that make sense so how do we actually get them to do those things as opposed to um actually doing those things right because they can and once they actually are able to mentally get themselves to get up and do those things then we can actually give them ideas of what they can do right so this is one of the other issues that you know um, that came up because when i did suggest these activities they weren't ready to make those decisions because they were still feeling so low about themselves you're like i don't want to do them so this is a solution and it is something that's necessary but we have to get them from the point that they're in right now to the point where they will actually do those things on their own because you know we can't go to their home and like you know, make them do this stuff or whatever and their family members can push them around and stuff right so this is the situation um, you're right that that is something that needs to be done how do we get them from this state to that point If you like more time to think about it, we can start off with this question. If I'm, if I'm pushing you guys too much. I think you have a very specific answer you're looking for. <laughs> but there's, there's, um, in these cases, there's, um, there's a sort of like a procedure. And so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get us to get it, understand that um, like this systematic process needs to be taken in sense here right? the first thing was to listen and kind of understand what's going on and stuff and hear them out and so on right and understand that there's a lot of pain and stuff that's actually real it's not like because they did they, they they really tried to make this work out right um but when they feel sort of like they can trust you and you're actually listening to them and you're not like treating them as like you know why did you do this and stuff you, you should have known better and stuff right when you're treating them as like yeah it happened and stuff it happens to people and stuff and like you know this is something that uh, you know i i can see clearly that you're going through it's a lot right and I'm, I'm just here to listen to you and like to see what's going on and to support you as much as I can, you know? And, and if we need to help you like by directing you somewhere, I do that and so on. And as the person feels a little bit more comfortable with this, then they start talking about certain things and stuff, right? And they have this, like there's a trust between you and them. Um, and then you can take it to like the next step and kind of encourage them to take the steps of deleting those messages sort of, right? Now, like they, they can't really like go back and read them, which means that as time passes, because they can't refresh their memories, those memories are going to fade away. And those those memories fade away, those brain processes are going to start getting impacted. Because right now, it's like panic every time you see those messages and what you're missing. It's like you're living that wound, there. You're, you're living that, like, that, that hit every single day. So you're keeping it fresh, right? But as soon as you sort of disconnect from it, your body is going to automatically start, like, you know, fixing itself in a way where you start actually clearing your head a little bit you can sleep better at night and as you start doing that then um you can start sort of encouraging them like okay now i want you to take one step just do one thing today that is gonna like something that you know you haven't done for some time right? and that's it just one thing and if you can identify some things that they actually like want to do and they really enjoy encourage them and say okay you know let's see if we can do that once a week or let's see if you can do that like twice a week or whatever it might be and say and give them some things to like you know talk about uh, maybe ask them like some things that you know they wanted to do in life or whatever and stuff or maybe give them some time to kind of talk about those things related to islam or whatever just yeah to get but like just to that process as they would be able to like add on more things and then they would actually be able to commit to those other activities like hanging out with their friends or whatever and so this is where you would encourage them to maintain those other social habits and so on 
and take the steps. And one thing to keep in mind here is that, like, um, you can you can give them expectations that just because you get those messages doesn't mean that tonight everything's gonna be fixed up. It will still take some time, and you're gonna still have these things for some days, maybe even some weeks, right? But we've taken the first step, and that's the most important step, and that is disconnecting and accepting that this is real. It's happening. Whether we like it or not, it is happening, right? Um, and it is a very difficult thing, but it's happening nonetheless. So as soon as the person accepts this and kind of starts taking their first steps, then you know, we can make progress. So this is the um, this is sort of like the first, uh, like this is the first stage essentially. As they get to the next stage, when they sort of you know their mind is starting to function better, um, they are they are starting to um, sort of move around a little bit more. They don't have those memories that are holding them hostage. Uh, it's the feelings are sort of fading away now, and then now they're going to be able to get back on their feet. They're going to do the things that they like doing, and yeah, they're going to they're going to start improving. But this is where you can sort of like just keep in touch with them, let them know that they're important to you and to your family. I think to their family um, that they are somebody; they're not worthless. And just because they made mistakes and stuff doesn't make them a bad person. But we learn from our from our mistakes by treating them as opportunities and. We just make sure that we avoid similar mistakes in the future by having some systems in place. So when you help them, like, uh, like uh, what's the word? Uh, like, they have things personalized, so you help them break away from that shackle, then it helps them move forward. So this is what I was really getting at over here, helping them detach the personalization aspect and understand that because it didn't work out, it doesn't make them a bad person because you know things didn't go the way that they wanted, it doesn't make them a bad person. And they don't need to give control to other people, they need to regain control of their life. Which means that if a person is feeling like the other person should have done this and this and this, why did they do this and this instead, right? That person who's feeling this way is the person that is there thereby giving control to the other person, saying, hey, you deal with me however you want to. You, you, you control me however you want to. You can control uh, my life as a, like whatever you want, like you, the, whatever way that you want to, right? And I am not going to make that decision for myself. You will make that decision. And if you get it wrong, I will blame you for it. Because the first person has started to feel so um, weak, right? Um, incompetent and sort of guilty about everything that happens in their life. They sort of start attrib like just giving up control to other people. So you can get them say, let's own our, let's own our mistakes. Let's take back our control and let's move forward. You've done a lot of stuff. In one case, the person had committed sinna. Um, okay, so you could say, yeah, it happened. But we can't really do anything about it. We can't go back in the past and say, okay, well, let's undo that, right? We can't. It happened. So let's move forward now. Accept it, own it, and say, yes, every action had consequences, but I can own it and we can move forward. And that's it. And I will be there with you the entire time, and that's it. When the person, when, you know, when, when I would ask these people, you know, how do you feel? About my like what, what about what I'm feeling about you, right? So they would say like you know I would ask them certain something like that, and they would like you know confirm that they didn't feel like I was judging them or um, I like I was looking at them down or like I would look down on them or whatever. They didn't feel like that because they felt like like I'm I'm different than like other people. Other people would have been like you know how, how dare you commit sin and stuff. I don't you know you should have like known better and stuff. You shouldn't have done this whatever whatever. It's true all this stuff that would be true, but it's not appropriate in this context. In this context, it's just a matter of getting the person who's already feeling guilty, um, getting them out of the situation, and helping them sort of see the light again and get out of the tunnel, cave, dungeon, and then just go about and like being themselves and like you know improving and getting closer to Allah and being functional in society and so on. So the the first part is just to like let them sort of like accept you, and then let them sort of like feel like you're actually gonna help them. And feel safe with you and then you help them get out of that dungeon or the cave in the dark place and then as soon as they're able to do that they're going to be they're going to start sort of like being able to walk around and again like the entire time um the stuff that i you know I, like i am telling them is to make them feel that they have control that i am not the one making the decisions on their behalf they are the one who delete those messages and that's what they did as a first step to like you know move forward they are the ones that stop you know like not stop uh stop um blaming somebody like the other person for like what they did to them but they're saying instead okay i also accept that 
I did let them get a little bit too close to me. I, I you know, I, I, my expectations didn't align with the reality. I was expecting that, like, and my expectations were the same as my hope. I was hoping that, like, we're going to live happily ever, ever after. And I was just in La La Land, sort of, right? And here I am coming back to this, uh, this, like, actual reality. And I'm saying I hope things work out. But if they don't work out, no problem, because it lies the one in control, right? I will do my part. Um, and whatever happens, I'm good with that. So this is coming back to um, one word that Allah Taala uses. This is uh, in the context of marriages. He says, mm-hmm. That he made between you, mawadda, which is like coming from the word, uh, like uh, yeah, there's there's a word, uh, there's a name of Allah Taala, al wudud, to the same root words, and it's coming from um, this uh, this meaning of love. Like a person has his affection, as in this person, by themselves, are a loving person, right? That's who they are. And it's not transactional where you're loving somebody because somebody else loves you or because they're doing something to you. You are by default internally this kind of person. Whatever the outside is, it doesn't matter. You are a loving person to begin with and to end with and that's it, right? Whatever the context is. So if you have it like that and it's not transactional, then it makes it a lot easier for you to navigate, you know, your context and stuff. So if somebody didn't do what you, um, or like what, what like another person might expect them to do, you're not bothered by it because you sort of keep them that space. And so this goes back to what scholars mentioned, for example, about give yourself that heart, like a, a more strict criteria and use the lenient criteria with other people. Like be easy on other people, but be strict on yourself. Meaning that strict meaning, not to the point of you personalize everything, but to the point where you say like, okay, you know, I need to make sure that I do my part, whether the other person does their part or not. And as you keep doing this and maintaining this, you become uh, known by that person as a person who's just loving and kind and gentle and so on, right? And on the other hand, the person, if they're doing the same thing, then it becomes, you know, like both sides are just sort of like being there for each other on the, like automatically without like a transaction sort of waiting to happen or something like that. So once a person starts feeling like something like that, they okay, yeah, okay, I did have hopes and stuff and yeah, things could have worked out differently. Uh, like, sorry, things happened because maybe it wasn't good for me and stuff. Maybe I was ignoring my parents' advice or you know, my, my friends and stuff, and I was looking at, I was sort of ignoring the red flags that were popping up that last I was putting in my mind, you know, in front of me. But now I started, you know, I, I, yeah, now it makes sense and stuff, yeah. And and, the, I'm, and then this person is able to admit these things because they know that you're not going to say you're a bad person for not doing those things, right? They're going to be able to feel comfortable to get out of their shell and own up their, own, own up their, or like own their mistakes and, and then like, you know, make amends. Yeah, like, okay. Well, yeah, I made a mistake. I missed the shot. I, I shot the wrong way and stuff, right? Whatever. Like in basketball, right? But it's okay. Let me try it differently next time. And yeah, I didn't hear my coach and stuff telling me to do it this way. I didn't listen to him. And you know what? I did, you know, I did see the results. Now I'll do it differently next time. Okay. Great. Let's move forward. When they feel like that, they don't feel like you're going to come there and judge them and like say like, well, you're a bad person. Judge them meaning they're, they're the inside, right? You're a bad person. So like, I do judge the outside and I say, okay, yes, these are these are things that shouldn't have happened. Um, but, and they have consequences that we just have to accept now, but it doesn't make you a bad person. So I, I differentiate between the two. And then that person feels safe. And even then, I'd say, you know, just because they make a lot of mistakes, I don't say that, you know, you're a bad person for repeating the same mistake again. And I give examples like Allah SWT keeps forgiving, even if a person keeps sinning and so on, but he keeps returning to Allah SWT with sincerity and like, you know, believing in Allah SWT. Uh, in his oneness and so on. So that helps a lot in terms of like getting people sort of comfortable, getting out of their shell, feeling comfortable that, okay, now I can admit that I, uh, I, I have a habit of like making bad mistakes. And then I tell them, okay, habits can be changed. We can develop new habits. And then they, they also, like, I always present them opportunities. I don't like sort of bind them to something and say, okay, well, you're stuck here and that's it. And that, that sort of like positive energy um, this is positive dynamics and this hope and stuff helps them actually get out of their situation, walk out, feel confident, regain their control of the situations and not be bound by what other people might do to them or whatever, because now they've taken control back from everyone else and they're they They have autonomy. And then you can give them whatever it is that you need to give them of you know activities that they can do, people they can hang out with and Things like that, step by step by step. The most important thing, get to them, make them feel that you're not judging the inside, 
you're acknowledging the outside mistakes and so on, but you're saying you're giving them hope to fix the situation. They got themselves in the hole, they can get themselves out of the hole, essentially, right? If you give them that kind of, you know, confidence, they'll come out, they will actually feel so, so, like, empowered, and until as time passes, their life is going to change. One of these situations, um, one of them, one of the girls, actually ended up getting married afterwards with a different guy. And so I reached out and I said, looking back at your experience, you know, what, what, what would you tell yourself? And this person responded that, you know, I was just young and I was immature and I was just kind of like being whatever, naive and like moving forward now, like, you know, it was definitely the, the, the test that I went through or that the experience I went through, other found that it did compensate me better um, than, you know, what I had missed out essentially. Like I'm really happy now and stuff and I'm not stressed out like before and stuff and Allah SWT is so generous and so on and so on. This is the same person who was having those kinds of like difficult, you know, things in their mind. <clears throat> so I, I, I like to, you know, I like for people to reflect. And so this person did reflect and they actually, and, and I think I asked them also like if they would, um, like what kind of advice would they give to somebody else who might be in a situation like this or something like that, right? But it's just for them to kind of also reflect on, on their own experience. So yeah and then they become so appreciative of the fact that you were there and you just like didn't judge them at all like internally but you were still fair by accounting the outside and you're saying yeah this was wrong but not it doesn't make you a bad person so like they feel so empowered they feel so uh, grateful to you but then you just tell them like you know it wasn't he as hunter as the one who designed the system right so i'm just sort of like passing on the message to you and that's it and then you know, that, that, that whole thing just kind of changes. They become more empowered. Their life changes. They start impacting other people. And then everything just changes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So one, one, one main thing pretty much is a lot of people do realize what they did and why it was bad and so on or what they got, like, you know, where they're thinking wrong, right? But they're just having a difficult time sort of processing it and, and owning up to it. And they feel ill-equipped. They feel like they're not equipped to handle further situations because they feel they're going to fail again. And people are going to say that again, and they're going to personalize. And so, like, that, that cycle is going to continue. So your job is to address that root issue first, break the cycle, and let them know that cycle has no like validity and it has no need to be there in their life and then and then give them back their control and kind of become an advocate for them that no you have control of this and i will help you and i will train you in whatever i need to to help you get back on your feet but you are the one making these decisions and you have that agency that you could you know, do whatever it is that you need to be in so when you do that then that helps them a lot so one one, one um, reflection that i had on this was just saying that we are sort of like the voice in their head that's already there but we're just echoing that essentially like they're having a debate in their mind and you are just sort of coming in and echoing the one that's actually helping them get better. it's going to be able to help them get better so it's not like they don't know how to get better um, it's just that they're really really overwhelmed with the conflicting thoughts and the emotions can overtake your rational thinking and so you are just trying to magnify, uh, amplify that that rational thinking and sort of like supportive system and so on, so that you can acknowledge that they are feeling the pain and uh, like they're going through a really difficult time and it hurts a lot, but and then you're there for them, but you're also helping them move forward out of that. So I told, you know, I would tell these people that, you know, that if you need to cry, cry as much as you need to. This is good. Don't feel like you cannot cry and stuff like that. No, you're feeling pain. It only makes you human, and human beings are human beings. So it doesn't change like who you are, and it doesn't make you a bad person just because you're crying. It just makes you a human being. So cry, like let it out because you're feeling that pain. Feel it, like go through that process. And then they go through it, and then like they feel better. So they feel like they can be themselves, comfortable. You know, they can. You're sort of like you're you're like it's like they have their sanctuary, and then you you enter the sanctuary. As if you are like they're the second like you're like them but like you're sort of like um, an advocate for them and so 
they can be comfortable, they can put down their guards and stuff, and they can like really like, you know, be raw in terms of like all the thoughts and all the conflicts that are, you know, confusing them and overwhelming them and stuff and just kind of all the mess that, you know, that's, you know, that's going on right now. Um, they just lay it out and they know that you're not going to like say, why do you have a mess in your head? They're, you're going to actually say, okay, let me help you in whatever you need. And then you kind of help them and kind of assist them and stuff. No questions asked, no, like, no questions asked me. And like, you're not like saying like, why in the world did you let this happen to yourself and so on, right? But it's more like, okay, we got to do this, let's do it. So the person like then is able to open up. So you're the, just that, the voice that's going to help them sort through everything. Your brain is already trying to sort things out, but your emotions are sort of like, you know, kind of conflicting. So now you're just helping kind of manage those things. Yes, the emotions have their place. But yes, also rational thinking is going to help you get over this and move forward. Okay, let's do that. Let's help you with that. So the brain uh, is going to then have a like an advocate, essentially, or a like support system, which is you. And the heart is also going to have its place to grieve and so on until they find closure and they move on. Does that make sense? I know this is a bit deeper, yeah. but you can. Okay. Any questions, any comments, any suggestions? Depression is a big thing, so ask away anything that you need and the feelings of hurt and personalizing situations um, can really have an impact on people so ask anything that you need any comments that you have if you need more time to think about it do it you know whatever you need if you want to bring some research next time or whatever that would be you know whatever it is that you want to do um, this is this i think it's going to be helpful if we have more people aware of this and they understand how to navigate these contexts If we don't have anything else, inshallah, then we'll go ahead and conclude. And um, if you have anything for next time, you can also mention that here. But in summary, just keep in mind that at the end of the day, understanding how things work is the first step in addressing how, uh, in terms of addressing them effectively. So that's what we're trying to do over here. And this whole series has been about helping people navigate different scenarios and like differentiating between things that are like capital T truths versus small T truths that are often, often people's perceptions and things like that based on their their histories, their life stories, their, you know, whatever. Um, and so, and we can also address them in terms of like changing them with new data points and different data points and erasing some of the bad ones and so on. Right? So at least resolving some of the conflicts uh, by filling in the gaps with things that make more sense for us um, in those negative experiences and stuff like that by you know, essentially unhooking the negative memory anchors and things like that that uh, might be affecting the person. So, yeah, I hope this made sense. And with that, inshallah, we'll go ahead and conclude. And your homework is just try to internalize what we talked about and really think about how your actions can impact other people, but also how other people's actions have impacted you in terms of how you do things, how you navigate your life and so on. And, um, you know, use yourself as a reflection to see how uh, you can interact with another person at the very core level, right? And, and don't assume that your perceptions of things are going to be exactly the same as the other person because you might speak in a certain way um, and, and the other person might understand it differently. So when I say like kind of compare yourself, like you use yourself as a reflection, uh, what I mean is more fundamentally, people like to be, feel, like they like to feel uh, wanted. They like to feel sort of like, you know, uh, like they belong somewhere and stuff. They like to feel welcome and they like to feel good and so on. So, but um, that is all, all of us are connected like that essentially. But the how of it may be, uh, can, may need to be customized uh, and contextualized for each person in each context. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and conclude. Uh, um, I know the activity took a lot longer, but um, I think it's good that we went through this, and I think um, it's it's timely um, uh, because uh, there was a tragedy in, in like over the weekend, um, and I believe the families uh, and others that are impacted. There's a lot of youth that were impacted as well because um, like you did this tragedy impacted a lot of people in the Morrisville community. So I hope that you know if you guys have these tools that you can share them and you can apply them um, with people that are going through these situations. And um, a lot of these, a lot of the youth that are you know impacted by this and the family members are gonna need what's called psychological first aid. 
which is right immediately after a, uh, like a like an event or something big traumatic experience and this is the first sort of first line of uh, defense essentially the first stage in terms of uh, working with people before they go into long-term mental health treatment the psychological first aid is the first response that you do right after an immediate like situation and then after that they can go into um, they can get therapy and so on so there's research that was done and it indicated that this first response is more effective um, uh, this first response before the, the, the long-term commitments you know in mental health treatments like therapies and so on the first response um, going in that sequence of events is more effective than immediately going to mental health treatment and therapy um, from the get-go so just just keep that in mind over here. and a lot of people because of this first aid can really get out of that situation and not have to go through long-term therapy and stuff like that so initial responses can be really powerful here <clears throat> So with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude, inshallah. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, shadu Allah, ilaha ilaha anta, astaghfiruka wa atubilek.